following lecture was produced by Glorian Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Mechanical humanity versus cognizant humanity. The word human is a compound word made of two words. Hum and manas. The word manas, we explained there is a Sanskrit word that means mind. That's why, that's why when we said man, we are uh, pointing the mind. <coughs> In this mind, of course, characterizes itself because it reasoning, it reasons. The reasoning, the difference between the mind of uh, irrational animals, because as you know, we explained also that mind is an element that exists in animals, plants, minerals. It's not just a patrimony the human being. But the difference between the mind of the inferior kingdoms of nature with our mind is that we reason. So the reasoning is precisely the difference. That's why uh, we are called man. The other word before human is whom. H-U-M, whom, which many times we have stated is the spirit, but the spiritus earth, spiritus earth in Latin, meaning the element that is the life within the humus, H-U-M-U-S, humus. In Latin, which means <coughs> that matter, that dirt, which is written in the book of Genesis, that is stated that in the beginning, God made the mind, the man, from the humus or from the dust of the earth, which is a symbol. That dust, of course, implies the humus implies the elements, chemical elements and other unknown elements within which the spirit of God, the spirit of earth is hovering according to the book of Genesis. So when we study that uh, phrase 
that in the beginning the Spirit of God was hovering upon the face of the waters, that of course is a statement related with all the kingdoms of nature. But the difference between the inferior kingdoms with the human kingdom is that we as rational animals can take advantage of that spiritual force which is hovering within any matter. But in order to perform or to take advantage of this spiritual earth, this spirit of God, we had to know. We had to have the knowledge about it. Because that, it doesn't occur mechanically. That's why the title of this lecture is Mechanical Humanity and Cognizant Humanity. In other words, we are pointing with this title the way in which that Spirit of God creates in a mechanical way. And the way in which this Spirit of God can, can create in the cognizant way, which is the goal of the universe. This is what in other languages call the part lock duty of the being, which means the cosmic duty of the being or the cosmic duty of the spirit which each one of us has within. That uh, part of duty of the being is to acquire cognizance, consciousness, awareness of himself within matter. As we always state in different lectures, we always point at the tree of life which is this hieroglyphic made of ten spheres that we call the ten sephiroth, which shows us the different parts of the being in synthesis. On the top of the tree of life, we have the first triangle that we call the triangle of God, the triangle of the spirit, the triangle of the logos. <coughs> logos in Greek means word. Remember that it's written in the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. So this uh, word, or this logos, is divided in three that in Kabbalah are named Keter, Chokmah, Bina, translated into English, crown, wisdom, and understanding. In Christianity, these three aspects are called Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In Hinduism, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. It has different names in different religions. But always have the same attributes explained in different ways according to the culture and race. We state that every universe, or as we say it in Greek, every cosmos, you see, this word cosmos means order, our organization. So in the universe, we find seven cosmoses. In this case, we, as human beings, 
are called the microcosmos, the small cosmos. And uh, they say that we are the microcosmos of the macrocosmos, the large, because macro means large and micro is small. So every cosmos has to have these three primary forces in order to exist. These three primary forces are the creative forces of the universe. The positive, the negative, and the neutral. So we have three brains. The intellectual brain, located on our head. The emotional brain, located between the heart and the navel. And the motor instinctual sexual brain, in the lower part, lower abdomen, related with mo uh, movements, instincts, and the sexual activity. That is what in the Bible is called the strength of God. So we have three brains. And if you observe yourselves, you see that we think, we feel, and we act in every situation. <coughs> but... Unfortunately, we do it mechanically. In the three brains, we have what is called in esotericism the bovin cal de nuts. Translated into English means the vital values that the cosmos places in the three brains in order for us to be alive. You know that in order to think, we need vital force, in order to feel as well, and in order to move or to have our instincts. Those are uh, vital values that I repeat are called bovin cal de nuts. And uh, there is a certain quantity of bovin cal de nuts that we have in our three brains. That is according to the law of karma, cause and effect. So that's why uh, we are alive, thanks to these vital values. When these vital values uh, are uh, finished, when we use them completely, then death comes as a consequence. Within us, we have other vehicles that act through these three brains. Because you know that we think, we have thoughts, we have a mind. The mind expresses itself through our intellectual brain in the head. The Emotion expresses itself through the emotional brain, from the heart to the navel. And any type of movement, of course, expresses, as I said, what we said, through the sexual center. <coughs> Those bodies that uh, utilize this physical body through the three brains are called protoplasmic bodies, lunar bodies. They are related to the mechanicity of nature. The protoplasmic bodies belong to the interior dimensions. When we physically are tired and we go to bed and want to rest, we leave the physical body and we utilize the protoplasmic bodies in order to be a, or to exist 
outside of the physical body. This is what people commonly call dreams, the dimension of dreams. So as you see, everything that I am explaining right now <clears throat> is something that everybody has and that uh, uses mechanically. Because when you are tired, you go to bed to rest, and then you leave your physical body with the protoplasmic bodies, which is mind and emotion, into the interior dimension. You have your dreams. When the physical body is again strong, when it recuperated the strength in order to act again the next day, then we return into the physical body with the protoplasmic bodies in order to keep ahead with our life. That is what commonly is called the astral projection because that dimension within we, uh, where we go when we sleep is called the astral dimension. So everybody astral project themselves into the astral dimension, into the dimension of dreams mechanically. Everybody lives in this physical world mechanically. And it is because the moon is that planet that rules the mechanicity of nature. The moon rules the four seasons, the tides, the waves of the sea. <coughs> And everything in this nature moves because of the moon. So we act mechanically according to those mechanical laws that rule what we call the wheel of samsara. Which is related, of course, with the world of Malkut. In this uh, world of Malkut, the will of Zamzara, unfortunately, we live mechanically. We ignore why are we here, where do we come from, how long are we going to stay in this physical world, etc. And it is because the consciousness is bottled up within the protoplasmic bodies submitted to the different activities of nature that commonly irrational animals follow with instinct. But we follow also instinctually these mechanical laws and uh, we have no difference between the irrational animals with the rational animals. The consciousness is that that we call the soul. We call it also essence. In Zen Buddhism, the consciousness, the soul, the essence is called Buddhata. So it has different names. The Buddhata, the consciousness, the soul, is part of Tifereth, which is that Sephira related with the second triangle of the tree of life that we explain in different lectures. The second triangle of the tree of life is formed by all the three sephiroth. Hesed, Gebura, Tifereth, which translated into English are mercy, severity, and beauty. In plain English is what we call the spirit. The individual spirit of each one of us is Chesed, the first. Then 
the divine soul, which is Gebura, which is severity, and the human soul, Tiferet. You hear it? The human soul. So the Burata is a particle, an embryo of that human soul which abides in the superior dimensions. This is precisely that element that psychology call in these times the consciousness that we have within. It's called Burata. It's not a complete human soul. Because in order to have a fully developed human soul, for that we have to perform the parlock duty of the being. In this case, the being, the spirit, is Hesed, mercy. The spirit has to perform the duty, parlock duty, within us which is his cosmic duty, to acquire cognizance of his own matter. We, physically, are the matter of the spirit. Protoplasmically speaking, I mean the internal bodies that we explain, the mind and emotion that abide in the world of dreams, is also matter. That matter also has to acquire cognizance, or the spirit has to acquire cognizance within that matter, not only the physical. In order to be a cognizant individual, non-mechanical. Because the fact that you are listening right now about this and you ignore about it, even though you know that you dream, that you act with your physical body, but uh, physically we ignore many things about the physical body. When we say we ignore, I don't mean that we didn't read about it, meaning consciously, that you are aware of it. Because that's what we call cognizance, meaning to be aware of yourself in any level. To know yourself. And of course the spirit. Follows the mechanical laws of nature. In all the kingdoms. Mineral kingdom. Plant kingdom. Animal kingdom. And the souls that evolve. In those kingdoms. Follow the rules. Of the cosmos. Of the mechanicity of nature in the evolving aspect. Of course, everything is constructive, everything is positive in that way, but mechanically. The mind in the mineral kingdom, in the plant kingdom, in the human kingdom, obeys the laws of nature which are mechanical, and there is no problem, but they have no cognizance. They are not aware of that. Just follow the rules. <coughs> when we enter into this level in which we acquire intellect, intellect, reasoning, then we have the opportunity to become cognizant of all of that. And then our being, our spirit, can perform the parlock duty, his cosmic duty, which is to awake. You see? While in the animal kingdom, in the plant kingdom, and in the mineral kingdom, all of those spirits or forces that animate those kingdoms, they have no personal cognizance self-knowledge of themselves because they always follow the mechanicity of the moon. So then, 
the first step when we enter into the kingdom of the humanoid, we call it this level humanoid. We cannot call it human kingdom because a true human is the one that has control of his matter. In the beginning, we stated that manas means mind. But when we talk about the mind, we also talk about the matter in any level. Matter exists in the physical level, which is this physical body, or anything that you find in the universe is physical matter, cellular. But the matter exists also internally. The protoplasmic bodies with which we dream are also made of matter, but molecular, atomic matter, more subtle. So therefore, there exist many types of matters, mechanical and cognizant matter. So when we study humanity, when we go into this society, we discover that there are three types of human beings, or better said, three types of humanoids that act mechanically, <coughs> that still are not cognizant of themselves. The first one is called the instinctual humanoid that is centered in the instinctual sexual motor center. His center of gravity is the instinctual center, motor center. Then we have another, which is above the instinctual, which is the emotional. That is the individual that has his center of gravity in the emotional center. In other words, his consciousness goes around emotions. And above the emotional humanoid, we find the intellectual humanoid, whose center of gravity is the intellect, the head. If you observed humanity in this way, you understand that there is no organization. There is a conflict among these three types of mechanical individuals. And that is precisely, we will say, an example that we can place only in relation with us in this very moment, with our physical body, in order for you to see how this society is. Let's say, for instance, that a relative of yours died. Then you go to his funeral. Then in the funeral, emotionally, you feel sad, depressed, because you loved that relative of yours very much. And then you are there in front of uh, the coffin, feeling in your heart, in the, your emotional center, a lot of pain. Of course, your emotional ego is taking care of you there. Then, in your intellectual brain, if you observe, you will see how your mind works. You are wondering why. Why he has to leave. I love him very much. What I'm going to do now with my life? You start thinking. You see another person there, another ego, another I, trying to analyze what you're feeling. And your motor center, if you observe, 
wants to just to run away. Doesn't want to, to face the situation. Maybe there is somebody there that you don't like, a relative of yours, and you have to force, uh, forcibly to be there, and, and you want to run away, to leave the place. So there are three aspects of you there in the same situation. One who wants to leave, the other that is suffering, and the other that is thinking what's going on, why he died. So then, that happened in any event of your life. It is very difficult to find a person that is with his, with his three brains in the very moment in balance. Usually, the brain, the intellectual brain is doing something, the emotional is doing another, and the motor is doing another thing. So internally, we are always in conflict. So to control the three brains is a part of duty of the spirit. But if you observe society, you find that there are people centered in the intellectual brain that organize in different places. They're very intellectual. They, go, they like to go to the library and read books. They call it book world. But there are other people that are more emotional. Some of them like to go to the, uh, American Idol and to sing in order to feel happy and to become an idol or to go to Hollywood and become an, an actor or an actress. And everything that they do is related with the emotional center. So the type of people. And others that are not emotional, neither intellectual, they are very instinctual. They go and like to practice karate, kung fu, or boxing, or like to play a sport. So you see, it's a different acti act activities in this world. Of course, we know very well that this society is controlled by the intellectual humanoids. The intellectual humanoids control the emotional ones and the instinctual ones. In the instinct, in the instinct also you find people related with uh, instinctual drugs, uh, drug addiction, that they like just to feel sensations in the body related with drugs, alcohol. Because in these different aspects of these three levels that we are talking here, intellectual, emotional, and motor, there are many uh, types of vices, degeneration. People uh, like to watch, for instance, pornography, using the intellect in the wrong way and the emotional center in the wrong way. People that like to fight, the people that are very instinctual. They look at him and they immediately want to fight with you because you just look at them. You know, they're instinctual. So observe this society. The whole world, the whole humanity is a mechanical humanity. That's why we are precisely in what the Bible calls the confusion of tongues. Because the way... The language of the intellectual is different to the language of the emotional. And the language of the emotional person is different to the instinctual one. The instinctual do not understand the emotional, neither the, the, the intellectual. And the emotional do not understand the intellectual, neither the, neither the, the, the instinct, instinctual one. And the intellectual one do not understand the emotional and the instinctual. This is why uh, there is a lot, of course, of problems in this society. The First World War, the Second World War, happened among these three type of humanoids. They fight. In the emotional center, you see, there is what we call religion. A lot of sex in different religions. 
people that are very fanatic, Pharisees, but there with religion also we find other people that are in the intellectual center. It's called the scribes or the Sadducees that intellectualize religion. So they are different things. That's why they do not understand. Let's put example of Christianity. Christianity is a beautiful religion. But nobody understands it. And the proof is that they, are, they cannot be united. Catholics fight Protestants. Protestants fight Catholics. And many religions in the different levels, they always fight each other because they don't agree. Because they are centered in the different places of their body. There is no organization in themselves. If we have no organization within, we cannot have organizations without. And of course, if we take now Christianity against Muslims, Islam, or Judaism, and then we find also there a big trouble. Because intellectually or emotionally, they don't understand each other. Gnosis studies the synthesis, the base of all religions. We have no conflict. But there are people that have conflicts. Christians against Muslims, Muslims against Jews, etc. And always we want to accuse the brother, the sister of other religions in order to justify that we are right. But the, the reality is that the problem exists within each one of us, in the three brains. Because we are following the mechanicity of the moon through our matter, which is lunar. We were created physically, mechanically. We came into this world without knowing why. The physical body was given to us free. We didn't fight for it. But we had to follow the rules of the physical laws in order to be alive. And to do an effort in order to be cognizant of what we have is precisely the point. Because we had to take advantage of the, our physicality, our mind, our emotions. But the one that has to do it is the being. The being is the spirit. It's our father who is in heaven. We will say, you say that uh, prayer of the Lord Jesus that says, Our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. This is precisely what we have to do. To bring the kingdom of God, the kingdom of the Spirit, inside of us. But that is not by believing in something. It is by acting, by exercising pressure in the three brains. Then we have to understand from where. And who is the one that has to do that pressure? Is the consciousness, is the soul, the Buddhata. Because unfortunately, this Buddhata, this soul, this consciousness, is dispersed, divided, split asunder into many places inside of us. <coughs> we have anger, lust, pride, greed, laziness, gluttony. Etc. Many defects within. And each one of them is a protoplasmic matter that acts accordingly to the laws of nature, to the mechanical laws of the moon. The being has to exercise control 
of those protoplasmic elements that we have within. That's precisely thy kingdom come. It's what in Gnosticism we call the psychological moon. As a moon exists out there that moves all of this matter mechanically and all of the souls within that matter follows that uh, law mechanically, another moon has to exist. We have to create another moon within to push that mechanicity of that moon and to create another moon within. And that's precisely the parallel duty of the being. That implies super efforts. Super efforts. Implies the work of willpower inside of us. The soul, as Descartes, the great philosopher, stated, Descartes, says that the human soul has willpower acts in the pineal gland. The pineal gland is that gland in the very center of our brain, intellectual brain. You introduce a needle ear to ear in another needle in your, the root of your nose between your eyebrows, exactly where the two needles are crossing, this is where the pineal gland is. And in that little pineal gland is where the soul abides as willpower. That soul, that willpower, is, has to be connected with the heart. In the heart, we have the altar of our soul. You see... Pineal gland and heart is precisely why in Gnosticism we say that we have to develop intuition. But there are two types of intuition. Hunches here in the heart. That's the intuition. You follow your heart, your hunch. But there is another type of intuition in the pineal gland, which is by images. Sometimes a thought or an image comes to your mind instantaneously. That's called superlative intuition. Sometimes that works during dreams. When your spirit is, send, is sending you messages in images. That is in relation with the pineal gland. Those dreams which are very weird, symbolically speaking, are the messages of the Spirit to you that are coming through the pineal gland and that you have to interpret, meditate in them in order to listen the voice of the silence, the voice of God. What is your Spirit, your inner God is telling you, trying to guide you? He wants to perform His parallel duty, His cosmic duty. But for that, He has to Control the consciousness. He has to control you, in other words. But it sounds like sacrilegious to say it, but it is like that. You have to allow him to do that. Because within us is that other aspect which is called the devil, the ego, the defects and vices that we have, and this will is following that. It's following that confusion of tongues, that mechanicity. But we have to follow the will of God by exercising pressure. And for that, we have to remember God. Not to believe in God. To remember God. Because to believe in God, anybody can believe in God. It's, it's just a matter of, of, of the mind, you know. 
the brain, the intellectual brain, is a vehicle of the mind. There you have all your beliefs or non-beliefs. Then you find the people that really believe in God and others that are called atheists that don't believe in God. But here we are not talking about belief. We're talking about remembrance. This is in the pineal gland. To remember God, God has no form, is to be here. To exercise control of your three brains. To become cognizant. To acquire cognizance of yourself. So you as a soul receive the help of your inner being. As we said, our Father who art in heaven. In Gnosticism, in Kabbalah, heaven is here. But if you observe the tree of life, as we said in the beginning, Keter, Chokma, Bina, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the three primary forces, the Logos, relates to your head in your physical body. So when you say, Our Father who art in heaven, that means that you are remembering in the pineal gland your inner being. You are aware. Cognizant. Not to say it mechanically. Because remember, there are many mechanical people in relation with God. We don't want to be mechanical people. Believers, no. Remembering. To be cognizant there, always. And allow that force in the pineal gland to act. In your physical body. In your three brains. To be aware of that protoplasmic lunar matter that is you. Of course, <coughs> that is what is called the psychological moon. When you start doing that, you are creating a psychological moon within. In other words, you are creating a cognizant center of gravity. A permanent center of gravity in your soul, in your consciousness, here in the pineal gland. Because right now, your center of gravity is everywhere. For that, Master Jesus in the Gospel states, you have to love your enemies. Because if you don't love your enemies, you cannot create that center of gravity. That means that you don't have to love yourself too much. You don't have to have self-esteem to adore yourself, which is precisely the contrary that other psychologists teach in this day and age. But you have to adore yourself. Why you have to adore anger, pride, vanity, lust, greed, and all of those vices and errors that you have within. That's stupid. You have to fight against that. So when you are in front of your neighbor and your neighbor is accusing you, you have to receive that with gladness. How do you receive that with gladness? By observing in the very moment when you are insulted, the reaction in the three brains of those elements that you have within. Usually, pride, self-esteem is always hurt when somebody accuses you or insults you. The mechanical reaction will be anger. And that's precisely what we, we said. Don't be angry. Don't hate your neighbor. If the master says, love your enemy. But how are we going to love our enemy if we love ourselves too much? It's impossible. That's why in this day and age there is a lot of words, a lot of hatred. Because each one of us love ourselves too much. And when we love ourselves too much, we, we cannot love the, the neighbor. If we love our God, of course, then we can love the neighbor. Because when we love our God, then we are against our enemies, which are inside. Because God is love. 
But all of that that I have within is mechanical. So that's why Master Jesus teaches what we call the holy denying. To deny those elements that each one of us carry in abundance within. But not in the masochist way. Because that's mechanicity. There's a lot of people there that receive insults, accusations, and they think that they're doing the right way. That's mechanicity. I am not teaching you here to be masochist, but to be conscious, to control your anger, to control your pride, and that is only possible by being cognizant, conscious of yourself in the moment when you are receiving the insult. When somebody's insulting you and you remember God in yourself, and then you say, here's the opportunity to love my neighbor, to love my enemy. But for that, you have to hold the reins of your anger that wants to jump on the person and smack him or smack her. And of course, for that, you have to be against your pride because usually anger jumps when pride is hurt or with your self-esteem, your self-importance. It's easy to see that when you are conscious, when you are observing yourself. So that is to acquire a cognizant center of gravity. I mean that you are no longer centered in your ego, in your self-esteem, in your defects, vices, and errors, but in your soul, in your consciousness. And that's not easy. Because it's a fight at every moment, at every instant. So to acquire that center of gravity in the consciousness is not easy. But you have to do it day by day until finally you control your three brains. You acquire control of your protoplasmic bodies. You acquire control of your physical body. And then you are no longer intellectual, emotional, or instinctual. You are now an equilibrated person. This is called the equilibrated man. The one that exercises control of his three brains and any psychological element within. Then you are different. Then, when you arrive at that level of being an equilibrated man, then you are ready to enter into the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven that is preached in the Gospels is not for the mechanical humanity. Because the kingdom of heaven is another level above the mechanical humanity. In the kingdom of heaven, you find harmony. You don't find fights like here in this physical world. Everything is peace. But how are you going to enter into that kingdom if inside of you, you are a habit, a chaos? People think that when they die, because they believe in this religion or that other religion, physically they die and they will go to heaven. How are they going to go to heaven when they are in conflict? The devil cannot be in heaven. It has to be a control of your, of, your, of your own psychology. Otherwise, will be as taking... In this case, as the Master Samael explains in one of his books, taking a monkey from the jungles and put it there in a salon of friends with people that are very well dressed. You see, everybody will see what is this monkey doing here, jumping everywhere and destroying all everything. In the same way, will be us. 
If we go to heaven with this chaos that we have within, it will be like that. The angels will look at us saying, what is this? Monkey doing here. Right? Obviously, we have to gain the right to enter into the kingdom of heaven by acquiring control of our psyche. It's not by believing. And that's why in the Bible it's written <coughs> a message in parables that the Master Jesus gives. I am going to read it for you for you to understand. Master Jesus said in the Matthew chapter 25, verse 31 to 46. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and ye gave me food. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall say the righteous, answering him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee hungry and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw we thee and stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we the sick, thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I said unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Then shall say also unto them of the left hand, the goats, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepare for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and ye gave me no food. I was thirsty, and ye gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me not in, in. naked, and ye clothed me not, sick, and in prison, and ye visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee hungry, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I said unto you, Inasmuch as ye did not to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. And this shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. You might say, well, who are the gods here and who are the sheep? Everybody think that he's a mixed sheep. But really, we are honest with us. We have to admit that we are goats. Going into astrology, the goat is associated with what sign? Capricorn, indeed. And Capricorn rules down here. It's related with the knees. It's a sign of earth. 
that rules the earth, the goat of Capricorn. But then we have another animal that looks like a goat as well, but it's not a goat. It's a ram. That a baby ram is a lamb. You remember that it says, the lamb of God that erases the sins of the world is Christ. Well, the lamb is associated with Arius, the sign of Arius. And Arius rules the head. Now you see the two animals. The goat is below and the ram is above, or the sheep. Arius rules, as we said, the head, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The three atoms of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are in the head. So if you find here the right, of course, is up in heaven, and the left is down there in Klipoth, related with Saturn, which is death. Because Capricorn is ruled by Saturn. And uh, Arius is ruled by Mars. Fire. The God is fire. In the center of Capricorn and uh, Arius, the goat and the lamb, we find the heart. Right? Tifereth. That's the heart, Tifereth. So, of course, Tifereth is related, as we said, to the human soul, to the consciousness, to the essence, to the Buddha. So, we are now here in the heart. And we have to decide for the sheep or for the goats. It's inside of us. It's not what the people think. Oh, if I believe in what this religion says or whatever, and I follow that, and then I'm going to be a sheep. And uh, if I don't follow that, and then I'm going to be a goat. No. It's a psychological work that you have to perform. That psychological work is within your physical body and within within your protoplasmic lunar bodies. It's a work of the soul here in the heart in union with the spirit, as we said. In the pineal gland, we have precisely the seat of the willpower. In the pineal gland, we have the seat of an atom of the Holy Spirit. That when we concentrate in that and exercise control of our mind, heart, and sex, then we are following the Christ, the superior forces, while from our lower abdomen, the waist down, are the forces of the mechanicity of nature, the forces of the, of the instinctual forces, of the animal forces that everybody follows. In the heart, as you know, as we explained in previous lectures, we have what we call the Son of God, the Son of the Man. You hear in the Gospel many times, the Son of Man, the Son of Man, of course. Son of Man has different uh, significances, or different meanings. But in the physical body, the Son of Man is called the Atom Nus, which is a magnetic center or Christonic force in the left ventricle of the heart. That is the intelligence that we have in our physical body that purifies the blood. That's the intelligence that takes the impure blood, pump it to the lungs, and only to receive the oxygen, and that returns the blood into the heart in order to send it again into the whole body. That intelligence, or atomic intelligence here, is called the nous atom, which in Kabbalah, in alchemy, is called the son of man. If you want to look for the son of man inside of you, it's an atom. If you start following that atom and performing the purification 
not only of your blood, but of your psyche, then that atom will increase, will develop, and will become a complete human being, a son of man within you. Because that atom follows the solar laws. You see, there are two laws here that we follow, or that is humanity follows. First is the lunar law, the mechanical laws of nature. And then the solar laws, the solar forces, which are the solar forces of Christ. By following the superior forces is how we get in tune with our own particular spirit. And start, of course, creating within that psychological moon, which is the center of gravity, in which you no longer will be a mechanical individual that will follow your emotions, that will follow your thoughts, your instincts mechanically, and to make of yourself a chaos. Anything that you will do, if you start exercising pressure in your consciousness, will be solar. That moon that you will create, which is a psychological moon, will reflect constantly the solar light. Consciously. Not mechanically. Because this moon that you see there in the space, the, solid, the satellite of the earth, reflects the solar light mechanically and rules in all the kingdoms. And all the creatures of the mineral kingdom, plant kingdom, animal kingdom follow that energy mechanically. But when we start working in the Gnostic way, then we exercise pressure in the consciousness, and we create the psychological moon in which the light, the solar force, will be reflected in us, but consciously. We will guide the consciousness as when you guide the light of a lantern. When you have, you are in the darkness, you want to see where is in that room which is in dark darkness, you apply that light to everywhere you want and light your path. That's precisely the way in which you apply your consciousness. With will. It means that you will apply your consciousness in the different ways. with your will. Because right now, your consciousness is everywhere. You don't have control of it. And every individual is moved by the mechanical laws of nature. And the consciousness is here, there, everywhere. And that's why we are in chaos. We don't have control in our life and we suffer. Because if somebody insults us, we react with anger, and then the liver hurts, and different sicknesses appear. But when we are controlling our emotions, our thoughts, our actions, instinctual actions, when we act consciously, then that psychological moon is being created little by little. And then we are entering into this quality of person, as I said, that is equilibrated. This person is not in the kingdom of heaven, but is no longer also in the kingdom of the confusion of tongues, or in the kingdom of hell. Because people in the confusion of tongues, or kingdom of hell, they uh, are slaves of the mechanicity of their psychological function inside. <coughs> While if we start doing that, and then we separate from humanity. 
psychologically. And then we start understanding and comprehending them better. This is how we start loving our enemy. With comprehension. With analysis. With meditation. Because that's the way. If you don't comprehend and you don't understand that the one that is insulting you is a victim of his own anger, of his own self-esteem, and that's why it's hurt and it's insulting you. If you don't understand that in the very moment, of course you react also with anger and you insult. But if you are aware of that and you are controlling yourself, then you feel pity for the person that is angry because you understand that he's suffering. And then you said, why am I going to be identified with this emotion? If this person is angry and is insulting me, why do I have to be in the same way? Let me control my pride and see my anger. I had to comprehend, meditate, and not, not to be in the same level. I had to control myself. I had to have my own psychological moon. If this person likes to follow the mechanicity of nature, okay, let them follow it. But I'm going to follow my inner moon, psychological moon, my own consciousness. I want to reflect the light of the sun in the conscious way. And this is how you start loving your enemy. And you start separating, listen carefully, within your heart, the goats from the sheep. The sheep is that element that is fire, that is united with the superior forces of your head, of your God that enters into your body. And the goat is the mechanicity that you have in your body, that you follow instinctually. Sometimes, for instance, your body is not uh, feeling hunger. But because you like this type of food, you feel hungry. But it's gluttony. Any of you will serve yourselves is, I, my physical body is fed. Why do I have to eat this? Right? I don't have to follow this goat. You observe the goats. The goats eat anything. You know, this animal is really it's amazing. Sometimes I observe in South America, I remember a goat with a big beer, very old, and he likes to drink uh, beer. Anything, any kind of beer. They were putting it together and drinking that, swallowing the liquid, and eating anything around. That's a goat. So the same way we had to control our own particular goat transform that goat into a sheep because all of that goat from beneath there is damned you know all of these vices errors instincts are damned because it's what causes sicknesses in our physical body in our mind in our heart because we follow them mechanically but if we start putting the consciousness in everything that we do then we are bringing the sheep into our heart and then we are doing consciously everything, and we are taking care of our life. That's simple, because the Son of Man is here. It says, when the Son of Man comes in His glory, glory is hod. And hod is that force which is the astral light in the heart. Well, when the Son of Man comes in His glory, it means when your consciousness will start controlling the solar light in your heart, then you will see the division of goat and sheep within you. Of course, that parable goes beyond the internal interpretation. Because obviously, the person that follows mechanicity is a goat outside. And since there are many, there's a lot of goats outside. The sheep are very few which are the ones that control their selves, control their consciousness, control their protoplasmic bodies. They, are wanted to, they wanted to perform or to create a psychological moon. Those are few. Because in the goats also are the people that believe that they are sheep. And because the goat and the sheep look like, alike. But it is not to believe yeah, that you are a ship. You have to control. You have to exercise that dominion within you to make the separation. Then, when you start having control of yourself, 
of your consciousness, of your mind, your heart, and your sex, then you are entering into another level. And then you can become a solar man or a solar human being, a type of individual that is no longer mechanical but cognizant, not only in the three-dimensional world, because when I was advising you to do this practice of controlling your three brains, it's in order for you to be aware of your physicality, of your psyche within, in this physical world. But this, is, this physical world is not the only world. Above it is the ethereal world, and above it is the astral world, and above it is the mental world, and above it is the causal world, and above it is the conscious world, above it is the spiritual world, and above it is the logos, the world of the logos. You see, there are many heavens or many levels. Nine above us. But we are here in the earth. How do we expect to be aware, to be cognizant of the superior worlds or the kingdom of heaven, as Master Jesus says, if we are not aware of this earth? We first have to be aware of here to create the psychological moon in order to create the psychological sun, S-U-N. That's another step. But for that, Master Jesus says, you have to be born again. To be born again is just a matter of believing in something. It is by applying the sexual energy, which is the only energy that creates in the mineral kingdom, in the plant kingdom, in the animal kingdom, and in the human kingdom. To be born again is not a matter of believing, but of utilizing the sexual force. And for that, you need to know Tantra. But in order to perform tantrism, you have to start by controlling your three brains. Because if you are going to practice tantrism by following your goat, the goat, the goat likes to fornicate. Obviously, in the very moment when you have to transmit your sexual energy to practice the Sahaja Maituna, you don't practice it because you are following the goat. But if you are accustomed to, to the center of gravity in your consciousness, in the moment of the sexual act, you said, I'm going to steal the fire from this goat as well in the sexual act. Now you understand why Lucifer is symbolized with the legs of goat. He has the power of sex. He has a trident. That trident is the symbol of the three primary forces acting mechanically in your body, in your three brains. Intellect, emotion, and instinct. That's the fork of Lucifer, your three brains. And of course, you resize in your sex with the goat legs. So Lucifer says, oh, you want to control me? I have all the force of the three brains here in the sex. You follow your goat, and then you eat the forbidden fruit. Lucifer says, maybe next time. Try. And then the way is to control your three brains, perform a sexual act, by controlling your three brains. And then you are stealing the fire from the devil. What devil? You. Because you are the devil. That's the energy. Lucifer is not an individual that exists outside. It's inside. It's a sexual force that utilizes the fork, the power of the three brains, for the mechanicity of nature. So we have to transform that devil into a human being. Or as, like in mythology, they said, we had to transform the donkey into a man. Comes into my mind, Jesus entering into Jerusalem, riding the donkey, controlling his animal. You see? But everybody that goes now to the Middle East or to the Holy Land and enters Jerusalem, the donkey is riding on top of them because the animal is controlling them. We have to enter as Jesus, controlling the donkey, the animal, which is the same symbol as for the goat. And then we make that division. That separation of the goats with sheep 
is during the whole life. The Son of Man has to do it. So those elements which are lust, anger, pride, are condemned, damned to hell. We have to be disintegrate them. They are the enemies of God, which are inside of you. This is how we do it. And of course, little by little, the solar man is appearing inside of you. It's not mechanically as people think. The solar man is formed by the bodies, the wedding garment of the soul that you have to create for your son of man that you have in your heart. A solar astral body, when you create your solar astral body, and then you enter into another level. A human being, number five, that has control of the superior emotions and is conscious. When he goes out of the body, when the body is sleeping, he is conscious of that astral level. It's not sleeping, like we. And after that, he creates a mental solar body. And then he's conscious in the mental plane. And finally, he creates a body of willpower, which enters into Tifereth, the causal world. As we said in other lectures, he creates uh, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, the three children of Noah inside. And then become a solar man. He enters into the kingdom of heaven. So there are, of course, two humanities. The cognizant humanity, which is related with the astral, mental, and causal solar bodies, which are related with the superior dimensions, with the kingdom of heaven, as the Master Jesus states. And we have the kingdom of the confusion of tongues, the mechanical humanity. So in order to enter into the kingdom of heaven, you need to annihilate your moon, and you have to create your solar forces. And of course, there is another verse here that I want to read for you. When the Master Jesus says, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 to 24. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust thus corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The light of your body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thy eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Did you ever hear that if people read about this many times? What eye is Jesus talking here? It's not his eyes. It's a pineal eye. It's an intuitive eye. That is the eye that allows us to enter into the superior dimension, that allows us to see heaven. The third eye or what in mythology is called the cyclopean eye. You hear that the cyclops have only one eye, meaning that they are able to see only the spirit, not the physicality. So 
if in that eye you have light, as we explained, if you are exercising that control, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then the force of your God enters to the pineal gland and exercises on your earth, which is your physicality, the will, as it is in heaven. It means as it is in heaven means that in earth it is not. But it's your own earth, your own physicality. And of course, then your third eye starts working. And then there is light there. And then your kingdom, your life, will be full of light. But if you don't care about your third eye of the seed of your soul, and don't do it, and then in that light is darkness. If you sit in meditation and observe the center of your brain, and then you see, how much light do I have in that center, in that pineal gland, in that Sahasara chakra? And then you see just darkness. If there is darkness there, how much are those darkness? I mean, related with all your defects? But if you want to see light, well, then start developing your consciousness. Start working with the psychological moon. Because you cannot serve two masters, for either you will hate the one and love the other. That division is inside of us, the goat and the sheep, or God and the devil, same thing. You cannot work two masters. When you enter into this path, you want to follow God, you want to self-realize yourself. Meanwhile, when you go outside and you are, when you are with the neighbor, you're acting like a devil. You see? So to do the effort in order to serve only God is a psychological effort. It's a work that you have to perform every day to follow your consciousness and to clean your psyche. Because mammon is the mind and God is in the pineal gland here in the center of your brain. So you cannot serve God in the pineal gland and mammon, your mind, at the same time. Mammon is related with wealth, with the riches of the earth. As a demon, it's an individual that uh, treasures gold, money. That's why it is stated that this society is a mammon society. Everybody wants money, more money. Give me gold, intellectualism, everything in relation with his mind. I want to be famous, so you have to be a millionaire, etc. That's mammon. So to be against mammon is against to be yourself. Not to be a slave of money. You need money, okay, but don't be a slave of it. Don't identify with it. Follow the rules of God. That's why Jesus says, make for yourself treasures in heaven. Heaven is here, as I said, in the head, later with the pina gland, above, in your consciousness. Not in the earth, because here in the earth, everybody wants to be rich, wants to have treasures. It's okay. It's no bad to have what you need, and if you have money, good. But don't identify with it. Don't make of your life money. The reason for being alive to collect a lot of money. Just what you need. What is what you need? To eat. To clothe yourself and to have a shelter. So clothes, food, and shelter. And for that you need money in this day and age. Because in previous ages, in ancient times, you didn't need money for that. But now, money is a base for that. So you need it. But just to satisfy your necessities and be your priority, 
the kingdom of your own consciousness, the kingdom of your own spirit. Because if you work, want to work today for God, tomorrow for Mammon, or in the morning for Mammon and tomorrow for God, and then, of course, you are serving two, two lords at the same time. You cannot do it. If you work for, because you need money in order to survive, do it. But in, the, in your job, be aware of yourself. Work for your God. Be in hell as an angel, not as a demon. This is difficult. Because most of the demons like to be in hell and acting as demons. But an angel is test or is tested in hell. So you want to be an angel? You want to awake your consciousness? Well, there is a hell here, and you have to be tested. Anytime you have to be there working with yourself. And this is how you understand. Because there are people that, for instance, says, first, I'm going to have my home, my car, a certain quantity of money in the bank, and then I will work for God. That is ludicrous. Because then the ego of greed within you will say, well, you need this more, and this more. And like that, years pass, you get old, and at the end you die. And all that, those treasures that you were treasuring a lot, you don't take a cent, nothing. Because you go into the grave, and this is it. You go into other dimensions. Your life ended. So why we have to so be so identified with the treasures of the earth, with Mammon? And that's why Jesus said unto his disciples, Verily I said unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again I said unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle but for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. To be rich, of course, is not only being rich uh, with money. There's a lot of people that are poor, but they are very rich, psychologically speaking. In which way? They are very proud. They have a lot of defects, vices. And they defend their psychology, their, their pride against anything. They are very rich. In other words, the treasures that they are treasuring in themselves relate to the earth. If they see, if they have something in heaven, in their consciousness, in their spirit, nothing. They don't even believe in God. There are many atheists that want just to make money, etc. God doesn't exist, that's it. So they have the treasures in earth. They have nothing in heaven, obviously. So obviously, the rich is something psychological. That in relation with defects, with vices. How many lust we have within? Greed, anger, pride, vanity, laziness, gluttony, etc., etc., etc. If we have a lot, then we are the rich of this parable. And very, it's very difficult. Hardly we will enter into the kingdom of heaven being rich like that. That's why it is written, Blessed are the poor in his spirit, because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That poor in his spirit means psychologically. No mean that you're poor here or to adore poverty in this physical world, no. Poor in his spirit, meaning that psychologically you are against your defects and vices. And then you are becoming poor in the spirit and the kingdom of heaven is for you. Because then the treasures are in heaven and your consciousness is expanding, expanding, expanding and penetrating into the cognizant humanity. Poor in attitude. Poor, poor in attitude. Yeah, that's the, the meaning of that. The poor in attitude, not in money. Because there are a lot of people, for instance, gate masters like Saint Germain, is poor in the spirit. But he's a, a, a master that always appears and he dresses very well and always with a lot of wealth. But he is not identified with his wealth. 
He did the way and has control of his own nature. So purity of spirit is the attitude towards our own psychology. And to be rich is to be identified with your pride, with your anger, with your self-esteem, with your self-importance. It's very easy to see, you know, when you are before somebody that is going to serve you, especially in the post office. I experienced that. I am there and they had to serve me. I'm going to pay. But they are always, as they said, with their post. This person is the very postman. How do you call it? Well, that's angry. And they, they, they treat you very bad. Personally, my self-esteem and importance was hurt many times. Because, you know, I go there to put books for the people that I want to know and uh, And then I return here and said, well, she is right or he is right. But usually it's she because he is always very kind, you know. And they are very bad against, against it. And I said, well, she, is, she has the right. She, who knows how many clients he treat there that she is really tired in treating me very bad with no detail, no, no love. But he's giving me a service and I want to pay. So why do I have to demand kindness from this person? I have to love her. But believe me, in me, when I'm meditating, my self-esteem says, to hell with her. How are you going to love her? And I said, you shut up. You have to die here because I have to love my enemies. Right? And of course, it's, it's a lot of pride in you that says, don't. You are going to allow this person to be on top of you, to ride you? He said, no. I want to allow you to ride me, I said to my leader. I will control you. And if that person is upset or stressed because of his job, it's her problem, not mine. I don't have to identify with it. Let her be angry. If God doesn't stop her, why am I going to stop her? Let her be. I have no identify with it. And I go there with my tail in between my legs. I said, yeah, I have to be humble here. You know? But usually, if you, are, you, don't, you, don't, you don't have this type of knowledge, you just react and answer. And I see many discussions there. People acting, fighting each other, and sometimes making lines that says, this is unbelievable. These people are lazy. Look, they are talking to each other. And we here, I have half an hour, etc., etc. Blah, 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 blah. Very impatient. While you, if you are there, says, why do I have to be angry? If I start arguing like them, is the line going to go faster? No. It's going to be in the same pace. Whether I am angry or not, I have to face the consequences. I have to reach the, the window and to do my thing. So it's stupid to be angry. But people don't think like that. They are blah, 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 and comparing, talking to other post offices and other places, and like that, like that, and spending a lot of energy. Simple example like that. But when you go also to shop to other places, or when you are in different circumstances, you have to do your psychological work. Whether you are to enter into the cognizant humanity, which is called the kingdom of heaven, or whether you are going to keep ahead in the mechanicity of this humanity and when you are a slave of your own self. So humanity brings you opportunity in order to know yourself. And after that, when you know that defects and you annihilate them and you take rid of them, you said, my goodness, now I have another virtue, another power in me. My clairvoyance is sharper. That light that was bottled up into my anger is active now in my pineal gland. That light that was imprisoned within my pride is now active in my consciousness. Thanks that I was against me. But then you realize as well, really, I had to thank that person that insulted me because without the, his or her insult, I wouldn't catch this in me. So thanks to her, I am growing spiritually. So you love the person. This is how to love your enemy. 
when you discover that the one that is insulting you is doing good for you, if you take advantage of it. Because if you don't take advantage of it, you don't meditate and comprehend that, and then you're just developing masochism. Do you have questions? Yeah, the ordeals comes to you. The question is, uh, do we don't go and look for ordeals because this life is full of ordeals. Yeah. Where you work, where you live, your relatives, your acquaintances, then you have your, your gymnasium in order to know yourself, to know what is what triggers your pride, your anger, your self-esteem, etc. when you're in front of people. In an interaction, it's how you discover yourself. And if you know yourself, you meditate and get rid of what you don't like through meditation, through techniques that we teach here. That's the way. Well, but there is other masters that are very advanced that they no longer react before anything. But they still feel that they have defects inside. So therefore they go and purposely go for somebody that will insult them. And they start talking about what they love the most to this person. And waiting until the person will insult them and say, you are so tired. I mean, I'm sick and tired of listening all, all the time. You're preaching here. And they start insulting them. And when they feel hurt because the person don't take what they, they have, even when they do it with love. And they say, okay, thank you very much. And then I said, why did I feel hurt? And you go, meditate, and comprehend that. You say, I have to take that. I don't have to be, feel hurt because somebody doesn't believe in what I believe or doesn't follow what I, what I follow. I have to respect the free will of everybody. Why do I have to identify with it? But meanwhile, other people like to force you and open your mouth and with a spoon to put the knowledge, you know. This is not. You have to respect the freedom. People like it, good. They don't like it, well, at least you do the effort, right? But there are some egos inside of you that feel hurt when people mock you and insult you about your beliefs, about your, your path, you see? So that's precisely the work. So that mechanicity of nature is always, all the time, before us. And the opportunity in order to enter into the cognizant humanity is always every time, every second in front of us. It depends of us. It depends of our will to do it. If we, we are free brain uh, humanoids, right? If we rationalize, now dogs, cats, and what other animals are full brain, right? But people would swear that well, the cat, the dog, they have protoplasmic mind, but they don't rationalize, obviously. They have mind, but instinctual mind. We are the only ones that rationalize. Well, animals have self-awareness but not uh, in the cognizant way, instinctually, not individualized. You see, like, you see a cat is always aware of himself, but they act instinctually. So now we have to be aware of ourselves as well, but acting with the superior loss, with cognizance, right? And that is in order to study, because when you meditate, you analyze yourself, you comprehend and start discovering other lusts that relates to your consciousness. And you become cognizant of the mechanical lusts that are reacting in you mechanically all the time, like in any cat, like in any dog. Because meditation is the tool in order to discover and exercise control of your own psyche. You have to control your moon first. 
that moon, mechanical moon, is related with your mind, with your heart, heart, and with your sex. Three brains. That's your psychological moon. Always acting mechanically. So to exercise that, control of that, is to create your psychological moon. And after that, then you start entering into the solar light, the solar lust, which relate to the kingdom of heaven, to the Son of Man. The logos itself is God. <coughs> the logos is the word. The word is sound. It's vibration. God is not a person. That's why it is written, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. So there are the three aspects of the three forces. Right? The sound. The forces. But, uh, of course, in us, the Logos is the language. When we are in tune with the superior forces and we speak, then that Logos is a message. It's a word. It's the knowledge that we are given. But if we are not in tune with the superior forces, then the word could be hurt. I mean, we can hurt with the word, like in insults that the people use mechanically. They, the forces of the three brains mechanically. And they, of course, with their words, with their insults, they degenerate their psyche. And not you know, even their psyche, but also their physical body, their physicality. Do you know that the quality of sperm that men creates or the quality of ovum that the uh, woman creates is related with what we eat, we think, and we talk? And this is how the seed goes directly. So when you engender a child, they are inheriting your thoughts, your words, etc. Literally, only even not only physically, but all their mannerisms, their mechanicity. Well, if we are changing, and then the sperms is a quality, of course, different, as well the oven, and the quality of person is psychologically higher. So we bring our life according to our behavior the different circumstances, and even children. It's like you're raising the vibration of your being, right? Well... It's the word we've got, and that was the ultimate vibration. And so can you try and be very brave and vibrating towards God to raise the vibration of your heart being powerful? We were saying that you are raising your consciousness. Then consciousness vibrates, and then with the same in, in affinity with your own spirit, which is God within. It's a higher vibration, of course. God vibrates in a higher octave. And in order for us to be in union, which is the communion or the religare, the, to, to reunite to religion, right? the word religion comes from the union of the consciousness with the spirit. To acquire that, you have to be in the same octave, of your God. But then, when you enter into yourself, you discover that anger is not in the same vibration or octave of your God. Pride, neither. And all the defects. So then you have to take your consciousness out of those psychological elements and to put it in the octave of your God. And that's called religion, or union, or you, yoga, psychologically speaking. So, thank you very much. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. 
Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Thank you.